One of the most enjoyable of human pursuits is piecing together a puzzle. If it's a murder, why did he do it? A grand theft? How did they do it? A great escape? How did he slip through their fingers? Today, a combination of the above, penned by the great French writer of detective fiction, Maurice Leblanc. Leblanc created a Robin Hood Houdini type of brigand, Arsène Lupin. The very first French rogue, whose very first adventure is about to be related here. You mean to say if someone swims across this moat around the chateau, bells would sound the alarm? I'm going to throw a rock in the water and see. Andre, don't! The Count is exceedingly nervous. He has a fortune in paintings and lives in constant fear they will be stolen. This heavy water should do! Now see what you have done. I have to go inside and explain to the Count it was all a mistake. I lose my job over this. Our mystery drama, My First Rogue, based on a story by Maurice Leblanc, was adapted specially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis. It stars Lee Richardson and Bob Caliban. It is sponsored in part by Cat's Paw, Heels and Souls. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We are in France in the late 1800s. I should be more explicit. We are in Paris, in a cafe, on a sunny Saturday morning. A cafe which no longer exists. However, the Paris sunshine is unchanged. Two men are nursing their cognac. One is reading the morning newspaper, the other writing in a notebook. Well, what is the news, Robert? Dreyfus was finally pardoned. Shocking it should take so long. Oh, and listen to this, Maurice. Someone has put the sounds of birds on some kind of a metal plate. You turn it on, and you can hear it again. <laughs> what earthly use is that? Why would I wish to hear the sound of birds at any special time? <laughs> I'm sorry I asked you. Why did you? You only get angry when I talk and you are writing. Why don't you write in your room? Very right? peaceful. It's a choice I don't have anymore. My rent is overdue. Today, the landlord tells me if I don't pay what I owe, he will have me arrested. How much do you owe? I haven't paid my rent since last November. Not if I cannot loan you more, please. So, for me, it is prison. Who knows? Perhaps there I shall find some ideas to write about. I hope they will let me have pen and ink. It was in the prison Fontenay that I made the acquaintance with our friend Lupin. He certainly did not appear as the master thief of the century. I found him a cultured gentleman who, naturally, would seek out the company of another cultured gentleman, myself. Maurice, how old are you? I will be 35 in June, yes, sir. I will be 30 in July. We are the most talked about thief in Europe, and now America. You've been to America? A quick business trip. A little matter of a uh, Gilbert Stewart painting of America's first president, uh, George Washington. Oh, I know the name. I thought it would hang nicely above my mantelpiece in Paris. But Inspector Garimard thought otherwise. He came all the way to Boston and surprised me as I was packing. And so he persuaded me to come to prison. But if you end up in prison, how can you enjoy it? Because... I am seldom in prison, and then only when I wish to be. You will steal also, Maurice. I do? What? You write about people you must steal from everyone. But unlike myself, you have not found the right person to steal from. What you are doing is not profitable. I see you in your cell next to mine. Your pen in hand, your face gazing with the feeling, searching for an idea. I lay pity on you, my friend. I'm about to embark 
upon an adventurous crime against a man who can very well afford a loss, a considerable loss. In fact, he deserves exactly what I am about to do to him. Count Crespi, a Frenchman of Italian descent, took advantage of other people's distress, bought cheaply, sold handsomely. Bought a chateau and filled it with art treasures. To him, our friend sent a letter. Bonjour, my friend. Ah, ah, Andre. Ah, good taste, man. What do you have from the town today? Oh, something special. Something special from the town. A registered letter. You will have to sign for it. Uh-huh. Where do I sign? Right here where my finger is. Uh-huh. Andre, uh, supposing someone didn't wish to use the drawbridge across the moat to get into the chateau. Then he couldn't get in. Supposing he swam across the water, uh, what would happen to him? Before he even got to the wall, electric bells would go off. And we are all supposed to run and fetch the police right away. The slightest disturbance in the water of Hecot is switch. You don't say. A ripple in the water and the bell goes off. Uh, I'm going to try it with this stone. No, Andre, don't. Why not? This everyone should do. See what you have done. I didn't believe it. Now I will have to go inside and explain to the town it was only a mistake. I may lose my job over this. The postman accidentally dropped a rock into the moat. Marcel, what are you telling me? His foot, Count Kresky. His foot accidentally dislodged the stone and it fell in. What do you have in your hand? Oh, a uh, registered letter card. For me? I don't wish to see it. I didn't sign for it myself, so I don't know you have it. I don't like registered letters. Well, shall I open it and uh, read it to you, sir? Uh, that's a good idea. Go ahead, Master, read it. For oh, Count Christie. Cher Monsieur Le Comte, I have come to admire greatly the Rubens and Watteaus in your gallery. In addition to those paintings, I also know the Beauvais tapestries to the right and uh, in the room to the left, the cases of miniatures and the Louis XIII table. These objects can readily be turned into cash. Therefore, I ask to have them properly packed and sent to my name, care of the Garde de Batignol. You have one week. If not received, I shall see to their removal on the night of Wednesday the 27th. Believe me to be yours very truly, Arsène Lupin. A P.S. Don't send me the larger of the two Watteaus. It's a copy. The original was burned by Barra during the Revolution. And, And don't send the Louis XVI Chatelaine, the authenticity of which is exceedingly doubtful. That's all he says, sir. Oh, no. Did you ever hear anything like that? He seems very sure of himself. I cannot understand how he has such precise knowledge of the rooms in the chateau where the paintings are hung. Who told him? I never permit anyone in here. I read that Arsène Lupin is in jail. So did I. He was arrested in America by Chief Inspector Gallimard. Marcel, take pen to paper. I wish you to write a letter to the public prosecutor at Rouen. Enclose this letter from Arsène Lupin and demand police protection. Count Crespi, I came myself from Rouen. I have investigated and I thought the matter too delicate not to speak to you in person. Mr. Prosecutor, I am honored. It has taken me three days to ascertain the facts. I might begin by saying your chateau is quite impregnable. I had to call to the gatekeeper, identify myself, and the drawbridge was lowered over the moat, and your secretary came out to meet me and took me through four heavily barred and locked doors. You are right. Why I suddenly became so concerned, I do not know. 
<laughs> no one, not even a fan Lupin could get in here. I know the gentleman. Lupin? A gentleman? Yes. He's a gentleman thief. Uh, we became acquainted during the theft of the Mona Lisa, which finally the government had to ransom. Steal the Mona Lisa? A sacrilege. They should have locked up Arsène Lupin in the Bastille and thrown away the key. Ah, but nothing was ever proved. As for this matter, Count, I am informed that Arsène Lupin is now safely under lock and key. His every move is watched. Inspector Gallimard has given strict instructions. Lupin is not allowed even to write. Therefore, one must conclude this letter to you is a fake. Whoever has written it is not Arsène Lupin. Are you the postman? Yes. Are you the postman who delivers mail here? Yes, I am, sir. And uh, who might you be? I am Count Crespi. Count... I have never had the pleasure. I am generally met at the drawbridge by Marcel, your secretary. This morning I put on my old clothes and decided to walk around the property. Is there any mail for me? No, your grace. Not a thing today. Uh, that uh, is in the way of correspondence. Uh, only this newspaper. Uh, it is uh, yours. Uh, please forgive me. I was just reading about uh, Arsène Lupin. What about Arsène Lupin? Well, here, on the second page. Uh, show me, please. I came out without my glasses. Right at the top where it says, uh, Welcome visitor. Would you read it to me? Oh, certainly. Welcome to our distinguished visitor, Chief Inspector Gallimard, one of the veterans of the detective service whose recent feat of arresting Arsène Lupin has won him international fame. Monsieur Gallimard is enjoying his rest and will be spending his holiday in our village fishing. And now he's here. Right here. Most interesting. And I confess to have uh, played no little part in the new story. You know the inspector? Oh, I am one of the few people of the village with whom he is on speaking terms. On Sunday, I was fishing on the dock, and I noticed a gentleman next to me, frock coat, straw hat, and I saw on his fishing rod the name Gallimard. And I said just one thing to him. I said, congratulations, Monsieur Gallimard. If you catch fish as easily as you caught Orsain Lupin, <laughs> you should do well. What did he answer? He said, thank you, reeled in his line and uh, walked away. That's all he said? Not one word more. Where did you say you saw the inspector fishing on Sunday? On the dock. He fishes there every day. That, in effect, is how Arsène Lupin's latest escapade was revealed to me. The following day, my old friend Robert, the salesman at Beaumarché, came to see me. Robert, ah, oh, nice of you to visit me in jail. Maurice, I've decided to bail you out of prison. Thank you very much, but, uh, no. What? I am at the beginning of a fascinating story of a man. Who is it? My first rogue. And if I leave the prison, I shall never know what happens to him. Uh, let me say two words to you, and then you'll understand. Enfin... Lupin. Some have likened Arsène Lupin to Robin Hood. Others, less charitable, accuse him of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Which I'd like to observe was first said in 1560. Then, the estates of St. Peter's Cathedral were appropriated to repair the Cathedral of St. Paul. That's how these catchphrasings begin. But not how they end. More on that when I return shortly with that. We return to a small French village outside of Paris. A town noted for its ancient chateau, surrounded by a wide moat, owned by Count Crespi. 
The Count has been politely requested by that master of the picklock, Arsène Lupin, to divest himself of some of his art treasures. But Lupin is in jail. Did he write that letter, or is it a hoax? Author Maurice LeBlanc picks up the story. Not only was I in the prison cell right next to our friend Lupin, but we had occasion often to talk in the exercise yard. The guards took no notice. Lupin was a favorite prisoner. Stealing was essentially a game to him, and I remember him laughing and saying, I am sure I have thrown that miserable millionaire count into quite a frenzy, which he had. Marcel! Marcel, where are you? Count, I- I'm terribly sorry, but uh, I did not hear you at first. I hope you hadn't been calling me long. Uh, I was just supervising the locksmith putting a new lock at the servant's entrance. He has gone, has he? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I made sure he left and locked up. I don't want anyone on the premises. Understand? Yes, I do, Count. Uh, why did you call? Did you know Gallimard is here? He is? The inspector who arrested? Oh, he's here, is he? In the chateau? No, you fool. In the village. I got the news from the postman. It's in the local paper. I shall go find him and talk to him. The inspector. Imagine that. Right in our own backyard, so to speak. Inspector Gallimard? You know me. We have met. Uh, no, sir. I have not been that fortunate. I am sorry if I disturb your fishing. I'm surprised you recognize me. I generally keep out of the public eye. Your fishing rod, sir. It has your name on the brass plate. Mm, very observant. Inspector, my name is Count Crespi. I own the chateau one kilometer from town. It's an old chateau, a moat around it. I am very well protected. Do you have need for a moat? It came with a moat, I see. I have a very fine collection of paintings, objets d'art, miniatures, and almost a week ago, I received a letter. Whoever wrote it knows exactly where each of my works of art is kept. Now, who else but Arsène Lupin? Sir, I... if I had the smallest doubt of the authenticity of your letter, believe me, the pleasure of once more looking up that dear Lupin would outweigh every consideration. Unfortunately, the man is already in prison. Suppose he escapes. From the Fontenay prison, no one escapes. But Lupin is known for that. He is slippery, he is daring. If he does escape, so much the better. I will catch him again. Go home, Count. I tell you, you can sleep soundly. Nothing will happen. But I see Go him. away and stop frightening my fish. Count Crespi, I saw you yesterday. Now you appear again. I am displeased. Let me make this plain. I'm here on holiday. I've come to this village hoping to enjoy peace and catch fish. Please, go away. Inspector, there is a new development. Another communication from Arsène Lupin. A telegram. Ah, look at it. No goods received in Batignolles. Get everything ready for tomorrow night. I'm safe. Well? Tomorrow is the 27th. Wednesday. It's six for tomorrow. Just as he warned me. What is? The burglary. The theft of my collection. A tremendous loss. You are the only person in the world who always knows how to catch that man. And I, I thought, I hoped... No, that that's not true. The famous theft of the Mona Lisa, which Lupin was most certainly responsible for, although we could never actually pin it on him, we never caught him. Ah, you see, it is art that interests him. It is not art that attracts Lupin, far from it. It's the ransom money. You had to pay a big ransom to have the Mona Lisa return? I didn't pay it. The French government did. Hefty ransom it was, too. And the trouble we had to keep it all a secret... Very embarrassing for the security of the Louvre, you can imagine. But whether the money went to Lupin or Lupin engineered the theft, it was never proved. 
Did you expect our now? What fee would you take to spend Wednesday night at my chateau? Not a penny. Don't bother me. And uh, name your own price. I am a rich man, a very rich man. I am here on vacation. I really have no right to take care of the case. No one shall know. A matter between you and me. Would 10,000 francs be enough? Just one night. Wednesday. Very well. But it's only fair to tell you you are throwing your money away. I don't mind. In that case, I agree. Besides, one can never be absolutely sure of Lupin. He's bound to have a whole gang working with him. Yes, I heard that. That letter and this telegram are a case in point. Here is a man in one of our most secure prisons who is being watched every hour held incommunicado and yet able to send them to whomsoever he pleases. A coyard. Now, you had better leave me. We must not be seen together. Who knows who in this village is not in the pay of Lupin. Tomorrow evening, the chateau, nine o'clock. On the evening of the 27th, the Count dismissed his servants and his secretary and sent them off to their wing of the chateau to retire. As soon as he was alone, he let down the drawbridge unlocked all four of the bolted doors and waited. Promptly at nine, Inspector Gallimard and two other burly gentlemen arrived. Come, Christy. My two assistants, Detective Poignard and Detective Gallimard. Oh, good, yeah. Good, good. I'll stop this. Yeah, you gentlemen and I have worked together on many a case. Poignard, I'd like you to examine the walls for any unusual openings. And Gallimard, I rely on you to look behind all the paintings and tapestries for any hidden doors and to see to it that all windows are bolted shut when we set down to await the arrival of the ingenious Monsieur Lupin. Uh, yes, Inspector, as you wish. Good. Lead the way, Count. I've decided the best place for both of you to be on guard is inside the gallery itself. The Count and I will take up our post on the other side of the courtyard for I doubt very much an attempt will be made through the front. So, we shall keep watch at the back. Count, the central gallery can only be reached through one door. Just one door. That's correct, Inspector. This, this is the gallery. I keep it locked. It has just this one door, right? Absolutely. May I have the keys, please? Bonyard, Calambert. After you have made your examination of the walls and windows, etc., etc., the Count tells me there are plenty of chairs and benches so you can both make yourselves comfortable. Not too comfortable, mind you. Eyes and ears alert. Gentlemen, in you go. There are oil lamps on the table. I shall now lock you in, and we shall greet one another in the morning. See you then, Inspector. Now, Count, to our post. Good morning, Count Christie. Well, nothing happened during the night. Not a single sound. I was awake while you dozed off. Shall we have a look? You look out the side towards the moat to see if there's anything unusual. I look down into the courtyard. Yeah, I can never find my glasses when I need them. Yeah, ah, always on top of my head. Mm, not a stone out of place in the courtyard. Inspector, do you think that if no robbery took place last night, then it won't happen in our night? <laughs> my dear Count, even you with all your wealth could not engage me indefinitely. I am so relieved that nothing was taken. I can only presume in the same way Lupin knew where my treasures were kept. He knew you were here and he called it off. Hmm. Well, let's go to the gallery and talk to our men this time. Count, you shall be the one to unlock the door. Ponya! Tell him that. Look at them both fast asleep. Look, look! The walls are bare! The two Rubens are gone! What two? Where? Where are the tapestries? Oh, no, both of them gone! All the miniatures in the glass cases, nothing is left 
Not one little minute, sir. My, my Louis says, Constance. My Lord, look up there, that empty chain. That's where I had my agency chandelier. Oh, no, my twelfth century virgin has be taken. Uh, I cannot believe my eyes. The windows. No. Fastened securely. There's not a crack in the ceiling. There's not a hole in the floor. Everything's in perfect order. Ah, everything happens to me. I have lost millions. The whole event has been carried out with method and speed and great artistry, I'm ashamed to say. He must have had an extraordinary plan. I hate him. How can you talk like you admire him? I hate you, Poignard, wake up. Calumbert, stupid fool. How can he still shrink? Don't they hear us? Let me get closer to them. Calumbert. Poignard. His breath smells as if he's been drugged. They've both been drugged. By whom? By whom? By him, of course. Or by his gang acting under his instructions. It's a trick of his. Come to remember. At the Louvre, when the Mona Lisa was stolen, the two security guards on the floor were also drugged. That's it, then. It was definitely a family path. It's hopeless. I shall never see my treasures again. My dear Carl, you must immediately make a list of what is missing and report it. But what is the use? You might as well try. The law has its resources. What, what you are saying is I might as well give up hope of ever recovering my picture. He has stolen the pearls of my collection. Inspector, I would give a fortune to get them back. If you feel there is nothing the law can do to him, then let him name his price. Now, that is a reasonable idea. Do you mean it? Every word. Every single word. Yes, I mean it. Why did you ask? I have an idea. Uh, we'll discuss it in due time. Only, Count, not a word about my involvement to assure if you wish to succeed. I understand. You will be using underworld contacts, informers, and so forth. I swear to you, I shall catch him. As I look at this unfolding account of the miraculous theft by that Gallic gangster of saint I realize what Lupin has achieved by attacking the chateau as one would a fortress in real time. Planning, logistics, and a shrewd knowledge of the opponent. The master stroke by Napoleon of Crime. One of Sherlock Holmes's favorite phrases to describe his enemy Moriarty. I shall return shortly with Act Three. The cell in Fontenay Prison. Author Maurice LeDonc continues. As Lupin's cell neighbor, I am sworn to secrecy as to what actually took place at Count Crespi's chateau. Today, a visitor appeared. Someone who knew Lupin. Victor, the public prosecutor from Rouen. Thank you, God. I'll signal you when I'm ready to leave. You may lock me in with the prisoner. I cannot believe my eyes. Victor... I haven't seen you since, uh, when was it? And uh, you haven't changed in ten years, Arsen. No, you have not seen me since the affair of the Mona Lisa. That's right. You were in charge of the security of the Louvre. What, what happened to you? Well, after the scandal of the sleeping guards and the enormous sum the treasury had to pay out for the return of the masterpiece, I was filed. Now I am public prosecutor in Rouen. Ah, Rouen. Lovely place, lovely cathedral. Isn't that quite near, uh, what's his name? Uh, this gets me. Uh, Count Crespi Chateau. Well, so it is. Uh, and why are you here in Paris, Victor? The chief sent for me. Dubois. Oh, the head, the entire department. He knew of our former association and he hoped there would be a meeting of the minds. You know, Victor, I've always had the greatest regard for you. Well, 
Coming from a man at the top of his profession, I'm pleased to hear that. Oh, I said it a thousand times. That Victor is the most dedicated man I know. Go oh, sit. Go oh, sit. Oh, glad to. What a treat to see a decent man. Victor, through all these years, tell me to what I owe the honor of this visit. The Count Crespi case. Stop. Wait a bit. I have so many in hand. Uh, let me just tickle my brain. Crespi, Crespi. I have it. Of course. Two Rubens, a Watto, and a few minor trifles. No, trifles. A Regency chandelier, Beauvais tapestries. The poor man says he's been robbed of millions. <laughs> You're not going to believe that, are you? And by the way, aside from the chief, how did you get involved in this? The Count sent me your letter, which at the time I believed was a forgery, and I told him so. And the police, I don't have to tell you how little they know. I've seen the morning papers. Again, they're crying for somebody's head. That's why, for old time's sake, I've come to you hat in hand. You are decent to me in the Mona Lisa affair and organized the ransom. That's true. Tell me, what can I do? First of all, the whole Crispy affair was done by you, wasn't it? Off the record. From start to finish. The registered letter to the Count, the telegram... Were sent by yours truly. In fact, I ought to have the receipts uh, somewhere. They've given me a table with one to go over. Uh, I'm sure I can find them. Uh, but this is for the registered letter and this for the telegram. I thought you were being kept under constant observation and searched on the slightest pretext. Yet you seem to read the morning papers and collect post office receipts. You have no idea what fools run this place. They rip up the lining of my waistcoat, explore the soles of my boots, uh, listen to the walls of my cell. But not one of them would believe Arsène Lupin would use a drawer in a table as a hiding place. Too obvious. Are you going to explain the crispy theft a little more? Not too fast. The letter was the essential beginning. Yes? The essential starting point? Indispensable. The mainspring that set the whole machine in motion. The chateau was impregnable. A moat, electric warning bells, bolted doors, etc. How do I go about it? I know the owner of that fat-headed count lives in fear. One day, he receives a letter from Arsène Lupin. Notorious housebreaker. What does he do? Sends the letter to me, the prosecutor. Who will laugh at him because said Lupin is under lock and key. <laughs> I'm afraid I did just that. Yet <laughs> if he happens to read the local newspaper, he learns the famous detective Gallimard is on vacation within walking distance. He believes what he reads. How did that get into the paper? I had put there. Then the fish, I mean the count, rises to the bait and makes the acquaintance of the man he thinks is Inspector Gallimard, and he begs this man to assist him against me. This is becoming more and more original. So the detective engaged by the count was not Gallimard. I told you that. Thereupon a telegram. The count quivers with fear. He entreats the force Gallimard to protect him, and the so-called Gallimard brings in two of the boys from our gang, who during the night remove certain objects through the window and lower them with ropes into a boat floating on the moat. And all night long, the Count is kept in sight by his protector in a far part of the chateau. Count Crespi will be notifying the police within a few hours that he doesn't wish to pursue the matter. But that's not possible. The chief never mentioned it. Are you saying the chief knows more than I do about my business? This so-called Gallimard was authorized by the Count to negotiate a deal with me. And chances are when the business arrangements are concluded, the Count will have all his collection returned. And so he withdraws the charge. So there is no question of theft. It never happened. And even if you care to, you, my dear Victor, the public prosecutor of Rouen will have nothing to prosecute. Oh, God, I'm not ready to leave yet. We well, didn't come for you. He brought me my breakfast. But do set a tray on the table, Pierre. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. 
bread, ham, sausages, boiled egg, and coffee. They treat you well in the front of day. Of course, over the years, I've been able to secure jobs for many of those who work here. A few false papers, and they're hired, and they enjoy it. You have some of your own people working in the prison? <laughs> it's hard work, but they like it. Uh, where was I? Well, you tell me the Count is about to withdraw charges of grand theft. How do you know all this? I have just received the telegram I was expecting. Whatever you're talking about, you received no telegram. When was it? This very moment, my friend. Uh, Victor, have the kindness to cut off the top of that boiled egg for me. Gently. You will see for yourself I'm not making fun of you. It's an empty shell. There's nothing inside. Are you sure? Forget me. Just reach my fingers into it a little lower. There we are. Victor, I hand you a piece of blue paper folded quite small. Would you please read it? Yes. Uh, it is a telegram. Uh, arrangement settled. Hundred thousand paid over. All well. A hundred thousand paid over? A hundred thousand francs. It's not much, but these are hard times. So you have managed another ransom. I was getting bored in here. I had to do something to amuse myself, to occupy my spare time. Especially since the swindle could only succeed while I was in prison. I rather enjoyed playing the part of Inspector Gallimard. I think I did it rather better than he does. You mean that was you, not an accomplice? Of course it was me. But how did you get out of here? I walked out. How could you do that? As easily as having a telegram brought to me in an eggshell. You simply walked out of this prison and no one said anything? What should they say? They knew I'd come back as soon as my business was completed. Did the warden know? He was the only one in the entire Fontenay prison who was deceived. The rest of the prison staff reported I was in my cell, asleep, awake at meals, in the exercise yard, etc., etc. Why did they cover for you like that? I told you, the guards are my friends. Arsène Lupin remains in prison as long as he wishes to, and not a moment longer. Oh, God... Will you open up the cell door, please? Uh, Victor, a moment. Ah, huh? what is it? You've forgotten your new gold watch. I have no. Yes. I just happened to find it in my pocket. Here. Oh, please forgive me. <laughs> An old bad habit. Uh, they've taken mine, but that's no reason why I should rob you of yours. Especially since I have a watch here which keeps perfect time. Did I show it to you? Isn't this a beauty? Also, solid gold. Heavy gold chain. And out of whose pocket did it come? A good question. I never look. J.G. The initial J.G. on the case. Not the nurse to let stand for. Of course, I remember. Jean Gallimard. The real Gallimard. Who arrested me in Boston. Not many people know his first name is Jean. You ask me how I know all this. These extraordinary machinations of one Enfant Lupin. How could I not? I occupied the cell next to his. The day before he skipped out of prison for good, I had to delicately put to him that I'd been spying on him and that he so inspired me, I hoped to write a series of Arsène Lupin books, and would he give me his permission to do it? And he said, My dear Maurice, of course you can. I like the name you have chosen to call me. Arsène Lupin. It looks sinful and wolfish. But since it is a name you made up and not my real name, why not? No one in France would recognize it as me, because you will probably have a difficult time making me appear as clever as I am. Au revoir, mon vieux. Au bon succès with your books. Louis Le 
LeBlanc's creation, Arsène Lupin, from the moment it was first published, took France and the continent by storm, then crossed the oceans, and the English and Americans took the light-fingered gentleman housebreaker to their hearts. In a way, we can sympathize with a man like that who can bring a crime, culture, and cleverness to our imagination. Vicariously, we can steal with him without any of the dangers. I shall return shortly. Everybody calls them eight spots.